my son, for example, he went to University of Texas, got a marketing degree, but then he went to law school at SMU and he graduated. A guy passed the bar in his first attempt, went to work for a law firm, and then went working for a company called NT Data as a staff attorney there. And as he was working there, he decided that he was going to start a YouTube channel on Pokemon because he was a big fan and expert in Pokemon. And turns out one day he comes to my wife and I and says, you know, mom, dad, I know you paid a lot to get me into uh, college and put me through law school. And it's a great experience. I got my law degree. But if I just dedicate myself exclusively to this YouTube channel, I think I can ultimately make more money than just, you know, working as an attorney. And we said, it's exactly what I told you earlier. I told him, you know, if that's your passion, that's what you want to do. We're behind you. Go for it. You can always go back and get another job in a law firm or do what you want. And he ended up starting the YouTube channel and he now has 1.9 million subscribers. Welcome to the Sports Backdrop, where we use sports as a backdrop for way bigger conversations. That includes discussing the latest trends and developments in the world of sports. I am your host, Eric Kazmop. This podcast exists because of the team at CAS-CM. CAS-CM is a B2B content production company helping organizations create and share their stories. We aim to create space where businesses can build assets and drive revenue through writing and talking. Content creation should be enjoyable and accessible. At CASCM, we love helping make that happen. Learn more at CASCM.com. When your team came to us and brought up this idea of having this conversation, it took us back to an article we had, I had written, probably been like eight years, and it was called Sports Bring People Together. I think a lot about that because there's so many angles to take with sports bringing people together. But I think a lot of times it starts with someone like you behind the scenes that's actually giving us the medium for us to take that in so I can sit down with my son on the couch and we can watch a Bills game together and have a great afternoon or a great, let's just say they played a Sunday night game, Monday night game recently. And it's the broadcast that brought us together. Whether they win or they lose or they look terrible or who knows, we still have that moment. And there's so much to that, right? Because a lot of it, what got me thinking is, well, it's got to be about the championships, right? Because that's what everyone's aiming for. If you're a Bills fan, you want to win the Super Bowl. Well, growing up in, with the Bills in the 90s, they lost four in a row. So was that a, you know, not an accomplishment? Possibly not. But anyway, that's the thing that people in Buffalo have to tell themselves that it's bigger than that, right? It's more than the championship. Sports bring us together. And you've been a part of that probably throughout my life of bringing a lot of telecasts to me, to my family, to my friends. And I think I heard you say that on a podcast about just the way things can come together through sports. And was there a moment when you were younger where you saw this to say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be a part of. Sports is more than just like who wins and loses. There's bigger stories in here. Yeah, you know, I knew what I wanted to do when I was in fourth grade. I just loved watching sports. I think about this even today when I know a big sport event is going to be on that night, like Monday night football or the Cowboy game, Dallas Cowboy game, sorry, Buffalo Bill fan. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> referring back to Super Bowl. Yeah, it's but all good. I'm really excited and looking forward. I go, that makes me happy knowing that there's a big sports event that night or any sport event back, you know, when I was a kid, there weren't that many sports on in, in the middle of the week. You know, there were just the networks, the main networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, and they were carrying primetime programming, except for on the weekends. And then the Monday Night Football came about, and then occasionally you would get a, a game by a syndicator. And I love going to sports events. The ABA, the Dallas Chaparrales, Dallas didn't have an NBA team back then. We didn't have a Major League Baseball team, you know, until I got into high school. And... Yeah, I love watching sports and I love playing sports. So I said, you know what? Why don't I make that my career? <laughs> so I set my sights on it. I went down 
to Channel 8, WFAA, the ABC affiliate in Dallas. Literally, when I was in elementary school, my parents would let me take the bus from North Dallas downtown to Channel 8 to visit Vern Lundquist, who was a local reporter, a sports reporter, the anchor for Channel 8 in Dallas. And I would go in there and watch him type up the sports report, prepare it, and then he would let me sit in the studio and I'd watch him do the sports cast. And then I would invite reporters, news reporters from Channel 8 to come speak to our class in elementary school and junior high. And on top of that, I was able to convince the principal of our school to allow me to again take the bus down or, yeah, the Channel 8 and go on field trips just by myself with the reporters. I would go out with the reporters and then we'd come back and edit it. And then I would take the bus back home and then watch the report at night. You know, so I was learning how to practically in the business because that's what I, I wanted to do. Yeah, it became clear to you very early that this was it. So then what happens after that? Well, let me ask you this. Are you making money at this point? Or are you just doing it for the love of the game? I'm not making any money. I'm making money and experience. You know, it's like, oh my God, like to me, it was like, I was so enamored with it. It was so cool to me. And, you know, I wanted to learn as much as I can. And the fact that they were letting me do it at that young age, again, it's all about you going out and making it happen. I mean, when I go out and talk to, Kids. I'm going to the University of North Texas next Wednesday night, speaking to them. And in November, I'm going to the University of Texas in Austin, where I went to school. And I'm speaking to the journalism kids. And, you know, there's so many really good, talented kids out there. But then there's a couple each time that'll come up to me afterwards and they'll ask me a question, you know, and they'll say, well, what classification are you in? Well, I'm getting ready to graduate. I just wanted to no, your advice, uh, how do I go about, you know, getting a job or experience or what do you think? And I immediately tell them in so many terms, you know, you've been in school for all these years. You should be and should have been doing it already. You should have tried to get an internship. You know, it's like I tell everyone, if you want to be a writer, then you need to write. If you want to be a producer, you need to produce. If you want to be a broadcaster, then you need to find a way to get a job calling a high school game. Go out to a high school game and call it yourself on your on your recorder, you know, and play it back. And then you have something, you know, don't wait for someone to come to you, especially in a business like this. But that should apply in all phases, in all business and everything. The people that really achieve are the people that are motivated and they're passionate. So I tell people, pursue whatever you're most passionate about, you know, because you'll do the best job you can do. And when you compete with other people, especially in an industry so small as mine, the most passionate people, the most expert people are the ones that make their way to the top and stay there. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say to people where... They need to make, you know, of course, everyone's got bills to pay. You know, some people don't have the privilege or have the means for it, but you could work two jobs, I suppose, because perhaps you would have gotten that job, someone else working in the studio by saying, hey, I'll do it for free. But a lot of people would just, well, are not willing to do that. Yeah, well, there's so many ways around that. Even with me, with as much experience that I had as a writer, writing for the Hillcrest Hurricane, the Daily Texan, then the Dallas Times Herald and everything. So maybe you don't have the exact job that you want right now. Get your foot in the door. I mean, with the Dallas Times Herald, I wasn't working in the department that I really wanted to, but I was working for a major newspaper and I was able to go down to the sports department and meet with their editors and everything. Well, guess what? Now I'm not only writing about real estate and consumer, I'm covering high school football on Friday nights. They asked me to edit a whole section on the Super Bowl, you know, and now you're making more contacts and stuff. And then while I'm doing that and making money, I'm also freelancing in broadcasting with the Dallas Mavericks, you know. So it's like that's where my 
heart and passion was. But sometimes those opportunities aren't there. So if you take a job somewhere in the industry, whatever you do when you're young, it's going to help you later on. It may not be the job that you ultimately want, but guess what? Whatever you learned in the past will somehow apply to what you do in the future. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's absolutely. And I'm sure the connections as well. I remember my dad said this, you know, you're going to meet all these people. And at some point, you probably won't be at that job anymore. But those connections that you're making now will come and appear later on. So he's talking about don't burn any bridges, like make those connections. And I remember I left this one company and I, I didn't like this company. I didn't like the people. I didn't trust them. I saw what they were doing with like commissions. This is in the insurance and financial services business. and I had to get out of there. And what was wild is I left. I had some opportunities. I took a job. My first biggest client was someone that I'd met while I was working at that company. And that person really supported my business for the first year or so and got me off the ground. And I'll for, never forget that because it was like, don't burn that bridge. And it was just like you had thought that was not a great time, but it ended up being like a critical time. Yeah, because what you're talking about is reputation and integrity. Those are things that you can't really buy, but it can end up costing you money. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. You can't really spend it to get a great reputation and your integrity, but we'll lose out on future business if your reputation and your integrity is not keen. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you were saying before about like the games that are going to be out. It makes Larry King talked about the wonder of what happens. You know, I get to wake up and there's going to be a game on that night. Like, and I don't know who's going to win. And I love that. And he was saying that. I was like, wow, it's just, it's so true. It's like when you see it from that lens, it's just a different, it's a different experience with sports. Go ahead. Yeah, I love that. But you also, you never know what's going to happen in a game. Like, for example, it was the last game of the season in 1984. And I was producing the California Angels at Texas Rangers. Last game of the year, day game on a Sunday. Both teams are out of it. And here you go. We're at ballpark. People are watching. There are some people there and everything. But I didn't wake up that morning and think that I was going to end up directing a perfect game by Mike Witt. I direct also, and those two function and roles are different. And then 10 years later, in 1994, I ended up directing Kenny Rogers' perfect game, same two teams, California and uh, and the Rangers. And I was the first director in Major League Baseball history to direct two perfect games. And that's fortunate, but I didn't, like you said, you just never know what's going to happen. So, yeah. When that happens, right? And in this day and age, right, you can change this channel. You get the notification on your Apple TV. Hey, this game's going to overtime. Hey, so-and-so has got a perfect game going into the seventh inning, you know, tune in. But news still probably traveled and whoever's paying attention is not turning it off at this point. I mean, you've been through it and maybe you're in the game, you're in the moment, so you're not really overthinking about it or are you thinking about it? Like, we have to capture this moment. This might just happen. You're ultimately, yes, for sure, you're thinking (laughs) about it. And some people are superstitious about it, you know, and then you want to cover that. Yeah. Are the players not talking to the pitcher? Do we train a camera over there? When the pitcher comes off the field, he sits down and no one even acknowledges him and he knows he's got a no-hitter going at a perfect game. Does the pitcher put his glove in the exact same spot in the dugout every time and he never will step on the foul line as he comes off the field. I mean, there's baseball has so many superstitions, but you want to see that. Also, doing one really helps you when you have that opportunity a second time because you look back and see what you did as a director or producer, and then how can you improve that? So, for example, Enrique Ogumbawale plays for the Dallas Wings, and I'm the executive producer now of the Dallas Wings at WNBA team. We knew a month ago before the season ended that she was about to become the all-time franchise leader in scoring in Dallas Wings history. So we prepared little graphics for the bottom countdown as the game was going on with blank till franchise, blank to record, blank to record. But what I remembered from doing other big moments like that was not only to instruct the talent 
that when the record happens, say it, document it, and let, you know, when the PA announcer makes the announcement, we want to lay out so we can hear the crowd, have the cameras trained on, on Enrique. We've told them we also want to see reaction from the visiting bench, you know, giving her applause and everything. So, you know, any banners that are being held up that say Enrique franchise leader. So when you play it back historically, you'll have a visual. Like when Nolan Ryan had his 5,000 strikeout, we took a shot. Two shots were iconic. One, a shot in the stands of fans holding up flashcards at 5,000. And the other shot, every time you see anything about Nolan Ryan, it's a shot that I took from the uh, first base camera of him walking and him tipping his cap up in the air. And those are little moments. Some of them are lucky, but others are great camera operators. But also you give them an assignment of where you're going to be when the moment happens. Yeah. Do you find yourself when you have those moments Nolan Ryan, a perfect game, whatever that might be, chasing the next big moment? Or are you finding, like I heard this, like there's also the ordinary game where not a lot's happening, right? Well, I'm just going to cut you off there because to me, there's no ordinary game. Okay. Every game has moments. Every game has storylines. Every game means a lot to every player that's involved and every fan. And also, on any level, it doesn't matter. I'm doing a Major League Baseball game. I've done three Olympics. I've done World Cup soccer. But I could be doing a Little League game, Little League World Series or the Cal Ripken World Series or whatever it is. And, you know, even at that level, the athletes and the fans, the parents, when they win a championship or they win a game, you can look in the stands and the parents are crying with joy. The players are happy. So even on a regular game, the players are very intense. They want to win. Just like when you and I would go play, you know, in a community. Well, I played at the JCC in yep, Dallas. Sure. You know, we yeah. play a basketball game. Shoot, I want to win that game. So I'm not playing for money. I'm not playing for a trophy. And that's like when the athletes get out there, they want to win. They're competitive. So... I approach each game that I do with research to find whatever the main storylines are, any records that could be broken. And then you have to be able to react to what is happening in the game. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. That's like the presence, right? Just being present in it, drama in the ordinary, but it's not ordinary to you because that's like where your passion comes in. I've, I've heard people like, they'll just show up to a high school basketball game because they love sports and they love competition. Yeah. Well, like when I produce, I don't just produce a telecast. I produce a show because I want the people at home to be entertained. I want to be entertained too, you know, so we have fun. You know, if we're having fun, that'll maybe come across to the people at home. Yeah. You had mentioned, but well, we're talking about these stories and you have announcers, you have a lot of people, you have cameramen, mistakes are made, there could be glitches, there could be whatever. Like, where does your stress level going on a daily basis? Or if you, like, once you've through so much, you know, someone could say something wrong, the camera went the wrong way. I don't know what that would look like. Where are you in all of that and managing your, whatever, your stress, your expectations of what should be happening? Yeah, well, sometimes things happen that are out of your control. You know, like Murphy's Law, like a camera goes out or graphic, we lose data, you know, to the uh, score bug. So now we're running manually. Usually everything comes directly into a, the computer from the scoreboard feed. And sometimes we lose that. Things like that you can't control. When something happens that could be controlled, or someone maybe is not paying attention or is not following the action right, those are things that can be upsetting and disappointing, right? But every, generally, everyone's trying their hardest and everything. But I've been able to temper my stress level over the years. But sometimes I'll leave a game like a football game, and it could be four and a half hours of pretty much intense behind-the-scenes calling replays and following the storylines, getting commercials in, talking to the talent, deciding what replays we're going to go to. You know, that's a lot of 
time in front of a lot of monitors and talking your voice and your energy and your focus. And so that can be a little stress. That could take an hour or two of time to decompress from that. What are you doing to decompress? Well, it depends what time the game ends. (laughs) If it ends at like 11 o'clock and we don't get out of there till I, me, 11, 30 or 12, the crew probably like one or two, but you know, I generally have a flight pretty early the next day. So I'm going to go back to the hotel and pretty much try to go to sleep. And then, you know, in my book, there's times where I wrote, I had an example of a schedule where I did like five or six different sports in one week in five or six different cities across the country. So, you know, I could be on a plane 10 days in a row and then getting up at 3.45 or 4.45 in the morning to catch a seven o'clock flight. Yeah. I want to jump to this part real quick because in your acknowledgements, you talked about your kids, you talked about your wife, you're obviously traveling a lot. I mean, that's where your wife, like you mentioned, is raising your kids, right? You're going to still be there, but you might be gone in five different cities during that week. When you think back to those times and you listen to your kids today, like where does that take you now? Well, it takes me now that I now have two granddaughters. So my kids are actually in their late thirties, my two kids. They each have a baby girl. One her birthday was last week and the other one's two year birthday is actually on Christmas Eve, day seven of Hanukkah, uh, two years ago. Well yeah, yeah. So what I'm doing now is I've cut back. I'm like you know, I'm not actually working for a NBA team like I did for the Spurs for twenty three years and the Pelicans, but I am working for the Dallas Wings in town, so I don't really need to travel. Even our road games we do from the studio in a Remy fashion, which is different. That's a technology that's evolved. And I'm doing, I'll be doing college basketball in this winter. And I'm also, this will be my 35th year overseeing the production of the Cotton Bowl for the Goodyear Cotton Bowl, the stadium show and the pregame show. And, and I'll be on a, you know, a little book tour the national book tour for the book starting Sunday. I'll be in El Paso and then I'll be traveling around the country a little bit for that. But I'm not, I decided this is the first year that I'm not going to work on Thanksgiving because I have the last few years either done college football or I was in the the Bahamas for college basketball tip-off two years ago on ESPN. But now that we have little grand girls, I don't want to miss those holidays anymore. Yeah. Was it hard during that time? Or are you constantly going when you had kids and had a family at home to be traveling, but them understanding like, hey, this is that career? Yeah, no. Yeah, you don't want to really leave them. And it's like a lot of the stuff I was doing was home. You know, Texas Ranger games were home. But, you know, fortunately, I had a wife that could understand and allowed me to do what I could, you know, for my career. And so I appreciate that. And I dedicated the book to her, my wife. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Well, you guys are a good team. When you think about you're in the booth, you know, you're producing in the truck, wherever you'll be. And you have someone we talked about before, Joe Klatt talks about you. He's on the back of your book. And Joe Klatt's a big name in college football today. You can't go very far without hearing him. If you're watching any games on Saturday, he's going to be calling one of those, one of the bigger games of the weekend. You were there for his first broadcast. When someone like new talent comes up and it's their first time, you know, obviously there's going to be mistakes, there's going to be energy, there's going to be nerves. And he talked about how you calmed everything down, which probably goes to what you said before. Like, yeah, things are going to be out of your control. You can't control everything. But I guess just in general stories from that and what was it like when Joel Klatt was coming up and other stories that you might have of someone similar? Yeah, well, Joel really had, started doing some games in Denver area, you know, because he went to uh, Colorado and was a quarterback there. I actually covered some of his games for uh, Fox Sports when he was a quarterback. Uh, Little did I realize a few years later, you know, we'd be working together. By the way, we did do a game at Texas A&M and at the walkthrough the day before, we went out in the field and uh, with our workout gear and we threw the football. Yeah, yeah. Boy, I I had never caught a pass from a college yeah. quarterback before. Yeah. I played football, but 
it's different. Boy, he could throw. Yeah. It's different. It's coming to you yeah. tight spiral, and yep. you know it's hard, and you better better be ready. Yeah. So, <laughs> great guy, but he had already done some stuff with a, another good friend of mine, Kenny Miller, who's now an executive at Amazon Prime, and he directed a lot of the games with me that I produced football. But and so I already had an inkling of how good he was going to be. When I first started working with Joel, I felt he was like a Kirk Herb Street starter kit, I kind of call it, because I thought he was going to be at that level. He just had that natural ability, and he's a very smart guy and easy to work with, and uh, you could have some fun with him, too. So I knew he'd be really good. And, you know, you just have to be careful, too. You have to, as a producer and a director, you have to find what comfort level your talent have with you talking to them on their IFB or their earpiece. Some announcers, you can actually talk to them while they're talking. You want to try to not do that if you can. But there are times where you got to get them to break, you know, and you're counting them to break and you're steering them into a replay and stuff. So, yeah, all announcers, when they're first starting, you know, working with a producer and a director, it really helps if you are working with them on a week by week basis so you can form a good chemistry. Yeah. And for someone like Joel, besides counting him down or going to a replay, what else are you... If, let's say, something's a mistake or you're correcting him, because you'll hear announcers, they'll say something, they'll say a name wrong or they'll reference something incorrectly. And then a few seconds later, like, oh, I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of times, if it's a player, usually this spotter up in the press box, the guy next to him with a it's called spotting board, and they're pointing towards the player that made the tackle or whatever, or they're writing them notes, or they're giving them hand signal, like, you know, that means like a penalty. You know, there's a flag there. So sometimes they'll correct them on that, or they'll write something real quick so they got it. But yeah, I'll tell them, like, if they say it's, you know, on that last third down play, and I go, no, that was second down. I'll tell them, or I'll say second down, or I'll say it's something you want to be as brief as you can when you're talking to the people on the earpiece. We call it the IFB or okay. Intercom. So you're working, and you mentioned the San Antonio Spurs. So you're there during their run, right? So you have Popovich, Tim Duncan, David Robinson, which I also think you worked when you were traveling around with the Dream Team, where David Robinson was on that team as well. So you're covering some of the most iconic NBA players of the, the 90s and the 2000s. Yeah, but you left out Manu Ginobili and yeah, Tony Parker. Of course, so of course. Yeah. Fortunately, my first season with the Spurs was 1989 when it was David Robinson's rookie season. So I got there right at the golden time and I actually was there for four of their five championships. And I was really pleased with the team. They first championship, they actually gave me a, a watch championship watch. And then the next three, I actually got championship rings with my name on it. And, and you know, it's like, but I'm saying that is because a lot of people, producers and directors that worked for teams didn't get anything. And the Spurs acknowledged, you know, our value. And I think that just goes to show you what type of organization the Spurs were. Now, the players got their rings, you know, the first day of like the regular season on national TV, on TNT, and a big ceremony with the, the banner going up and they get the rings and, and everything. My ring ceremony was actually next to the production truck, which is right next to the Dipsy dumpster. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where my ring ceremony was. That's where it. they just, they go yeah. here. They get here yeah. the box. But the box was a nice Onyx box with my name engraved on it and everything. So I don't care where I got it. I right. got it. Though. You got it. Uh, you got it. Yeah. But back to uh, Spurs, though. I mean, a funny story with um, Tim Duncan. So, you know, I would meet the team up in, wherever they were on the road, because I'd come from Dallas and I'd meet them and I met them in Toronto for this game. And it was about 12 o'clock and the team was still out there for the shoot around and the truck production wasn't opening till one o'clock. So I went out on the floor and the team was still at the shoot around at that point. So I sat off to the side and then right then the practice was ending and now Tim Duncan starts walking towards me and you, you've got to know that you're really not supposed to talk to the players. You know, and maybe you see them in the lobby or they come by or whatever, you pass them by on the plane or something, you can say something, but generally, you know, just let them be themselves to themselves. 
But now I remember Tim hadn't been feeling well the day before. So he's walking up and now he's coming right towards me. I look at his clothes, warm ups are to the right of me. And I go, okay, I, we're eyes are going to meet. So he, he looks at me, I look at him and I say, hey, Timmy, how are you feeling? And he goes, oh, I'm going to be fine. I'm, I'm going to play tonight. And then he looks at me and says, well, how are you? And I'm thinking, and you have time to really think through this. I'm thinking, he's asking me how I feel. I go, oh, I feel great, Tim. I scored 21 points yesterday at the JBA, the Jewish Basketball Association. Yeah. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, got to dominate where you can, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Yeah, he's supposed to be one of the good guys and you get to be around him yeah. for a long time. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Are you still playing pickup basketball at the JCC or the, the JBA? <laughs> Well, we have this group of, uh, like, let's just say a little older people, yeah. gentlemen that <laughs> yeah. we meet on Saturdays and play. But that was like a couple of years ago before I had my uh, partial knee replacement, but I could still play at this point. But And I play golf a lot. That's but, good. That's good. Yeah. You talked about another health scare, pretty serious, when you were with the Pelicans and you had a heart attack and you had talked about that organization and what they had done for you and the outpouring of support you had. What were you like on set? Were you on the premises? Like what happened in that scenario? It was on an airplane. I oh, was wow. on American Airlines flight from Dallas to New Orleans. Jeez. I'd waken up that morning. I'm in like really good shape. You know, I work out, I run and I have a trainer back then. I still do, but I still run. I still work out because I need to. I knew heart disease was in my family, right? And so... I want to try to stay as healthy as I can. And so we're flying and we're about to start descending down. And I was sitting next to a lady who happened to be flying in first class only because she was trying to get flight segments before the end of the year. And it was like December 14th, right around there. So we're having a nice conversation. And then all of a sudden I started feeling queasy and I started sweating. And I'm going, okay, so this is like, flight yeah. sickness, you know, it's just like air sickness. And yeah. just, you know, I go, I'll just close my eyes and I'll be better, you know, once we land, you know, whatever. But now I was sweating even more and, you know, I wasn't in like pain or anything. I just was really nauseous and sweating and, and everything. And they brought the, they asked if a doctor could come up to the front and I don't think he did anything, but said, yep, something's wrong. <laughs> like we knew that. Right. And then they made an emergency landing there at New Orleans. We got in there really fast. And then the paramedics came on and they said, something happened, you know, some sort of event. We're going to check you out. Your vitals are pretty good. But I said, well, LeBron James is in town. I've got to produce that game. <laughs> I've got everything ready for it. I go, so just, I really don't want to go to the hospital. But he goes, well, you really should get, if you get checked out, then you can get clear. You can go do the game. And I go, Okay, but just take me to the hospital closest to the Smoothie King Center so that <laughs> yeah. the crew can come pick up, you know, my hard drive with video and then, then I can get checked down and still do the game. Well, I was still in the hospital three days later because, you know, I had to do a test and they did a catheterization on me and they said my Widowmaker artery was 95% blocked. And because I worked out, because I had been in good health from that, an artery, a little vein had went around the occluded part of the artery and was giving some blood to my heart on that side. Otherwise, I call it a Hanukkah miracle that I found that out and I still was able to survive. And then I had to get open heart surgery. They determined because of that. And so I flew, I was able to get the team was able to help me get the cardiologist for the team, help me out. And then I flew back to Dallas. The Tulane medical doctor didn't want me to fly, but this guy was a heart specialist. And he said, you know, give him some nitroglyphs or in a little thing with your wife if something happens. But yeah, get him back to where he lives and have the open heart surgery in Dallas. So they did. And then six weeks later, I was already back producing games uh -huh. after open heart surgery. And usually the doctors say the minimum time is six months to a year, the people. But I was already in pretty good shape and I was motivated, you know, to get back. And so to this day, I'm, I've been fine and I'm clear to do everything. So, yeah. What does that do 
like, what did that do for you afterwards? I mean, I talk to you and I hear you and I read your stories. I mean, and just even going back, like so much passion and energy for it and a lot of gratitude, I think just like the, the opportunity you have to be in this, but to go through an episode like that, you also had another near death experience, which is also a, now it's a funny story, but it's not necessarily in the moment. It's not, I'm sure it's not, but like, and you could tell that story too, but what did that do for you? Maybe not what, I don't know what the question is, but cause it's just, it's a lot like me hearing I, it. Does I, it, it did. I mean, I was afterwards, I just, I'm a lot more emotional. I don't know what it did, but it makes you appreciate life so much. But I find myself now sometimes dealing with things, it's a little tougher. You know, it's like, you know, I did go through a lot. It was hard to come back, you know, from that, but I did. And I don't take life for granted. My father had a heart attack. His identical twin brother died of a heart attack while playing tennis. So it was in the family. So fortunately, I, I survived. But it changed me in that regard. And my wife, after that, didn't want me to work as hard. But just staying and doing nothing for me is hard. So yeah, yeah. You were going to go back out there one way or the other. <laughs> yeah, right away. As soon as I could, you know. Yeah, yeah. We've already talked about, we talked about Jill Klatt and you reference, or I think they're on your book or somewhere I read, heard stories, Bob Costas, Jim Nance. I mean, some of the biggest names business working with those guys. I mean, again, growing up from the eighties and the nineties, like these names and are in our lives, right? Like we don't see the people in the truck. We hear about it, you know, all this kind of stuff, but you see the names and you know, who's behind them. And then when you ever hear someone like a Jim Nance or a Jill Klatt talk, that's when they reference you, Bob, right? All that kind of stuff comes out. But like, you have some great stories about them, but working with them, having the opportunity to collaborate, chat with them, maybe go out for dinner with them, an incredible opportunity, incredible people in the industry, like what comes to mind for you? Yeah, well, there are reasons why guys like that get to where they are and stay there for decades. It's like, I had the fortune to be asked by NBC Sports to produce the official Olympic highlight video in Barcelona in 92. My talent was Bob Costas as a host. The music was being done by John Tesh. And the, one of the writers was Jeremy Schapp. Yeah. So Dick Schapp's son, you know, how can you screw that up? Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, it was a, you know, but I had to get it all done, like right away within two weeks of the Olympics. And I, you know, I was there while they were, taking the IBC down right around me, the International Broadcast Center, pulling plugs, pulling studios and everything. I'm trying to get, the, I had to finish it in the United States. And then I, had, I flew to uh, St. Louis to have Bob Costas finish some of the voiceover that he didn't complete in Barcelona. And so the session was running longer than I thought. And I thought we'd be done by five o'clock or something, but it was now six and Bob had to go do the Cardinal game and he had a son with him and he goes, well, you good? And I said, yeah, good. We'd lay down some of your other voice and we'll be, should be good. Well, about eight o'clock, I hear the phone ring and in the studio, cause I didn't have a cell phone. And then he says, yeah, it's Bob Costa. I get on the phone and I hear baseball noise in the back and he goes, yeah, I'm just calling to make sure you're happy with the work I did. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, Wow. He, yeah. He's asking me if I think he's good with what he's, I go, yeah, I mean, you're great. I go, the only thing is, is there's a part like in the wrestling area that we can make work. It's not perfect. Well, he goes, no, you know, I get done here. I'm going to come back to the studio and make it to where it's perfect that you're happy and NBC's happy and everyone's happy. You know, and that just goes to show you what kind of standard he has and why he wants it right. You know, whether it inconveniences him or not, but then he gets there and he does it and he goes, well, wait a minute. He goes, weren't you supposed to take a flight back to Dallas tonight? I go, well, yeah, but we're not done. And it's like 10 o'clock. I go, I don't know when I'm going to be there. He goes, well, why don't you, no, you come back and you can stay at my house. You know, why don't you just stay with me? We got plenty of room, you know, you can do that. And I thought, I go, wow, that is just so nice to him. And I go, but I said, I can't intrude. And I go, and he goes, no, it won't be an intrusion. I said, well, I appreciate that, but, you know, I don't know when I'm going to join here. I don't want to come in late. So any, I, I'll just find, get NBC to get me a hotel. But isn't that just yeah. so great? So I, 
tells you what kind of guy he is. And yep. Jim Nance, also, we worked on these Cotton Bowl highlight videos together. I wrote it, produced it, and then I sent him the scripts up in Connecticut where he lived at the time. And he literally, we were on the phone multiple times and he laid down the whole voice track on Reel the Reel and sent me the reels back. And uh, he wrote some really nice notes in my book about working together, which I really appreciate that. The people that really make it the, the top, they respect the work that the people around them are doing because they knew at this level, you should be pretty much at the top of your game. And they expect that, but they want to make sure that they're providing you with what you need to make the show as good as you possibly can. Yeah. Well, and obviously people appreciated what the work that you did. So it made a difference. Going back on the live events, I mean, things are going to take place when you're broadcasting a game, the world's still going on around you. And live events, news events happen. And I believe. I would imagine that you were calling something. I know I saw something about the OJ. I don't know if it was the OJ trial or if it was no, the, it was the, the it Bronco. Was, yeah. yeah. Okay. Where were you then? Okay. I actually was producing a World Cup soccer at the Cotton Bowl that day. But my game was during the day. But when I finished the game, I went into the production trailer. You know, after the game you're, or the match, you're expecting... You know, your executive producer recording for your all of people. You know, hey, that was, you know, a good game, whatever. You know, you always just follow up on the game a little bit, give your comments, whatever. So I walk in the production trailer and everyone's staring at the television. It's like, what? So the chase had already started, the slow motion chase. So I'll never forget that day. But that ended up affecting Houston Rockets were playing, you know, a game that night on NBC. And I think it was... Was that the Knicks? Was that the NBA Finals? Yeah. Yeah, because it was in June, right? So that would have been the Finals, yeah. So, And I put that in my book. But yeah, they were having the, the figure out NBC with Dick Ebersole and Costas and the crew, you know, how they were going to handle that as far as showing that on NBC and then showing the game itself. So, And also, you know, recently when I was producing a game on a network... I was told that just in the back of your head, just know that, you know, the network could break in if if some major news event happens. For example, you know, Jimmy Carter's very old in the hospice. So, you know, if anything happened to him, you know, they would just break into programming and, uh, you know, they have everything prepared for when he passes away. So in a situation like that, they're cutting in and someone's calling you or what takes place in that moment? Well, okay, so like when you're doing a network game, you're going to have someone from the network on a production channel, usually call a PR production cohort or something like that. And there's an executive from that network, a coordinating producer or an executive producer or someone that's monitoring the game all the time. And so they'll be the intermediary between me and the news department and then they'll tell us what to do like on my headset they'll say yeah something happened have your talent toss it to our studio or have a talent toss it to I me mean, when you mentioned walter cronkite you know who to david muir you know or whomever you know it's like so i'll do that and then i'll tell the talent and if it's something more detailed or intricate that they have some specific wording they need I'll either type it up and have it on a you know a little computer screen, or I'll tell the stage manager to write that on an extra card to give the announcers. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into these events, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot. For example, okay, so let's say we're the first game of the doubleheader. Well, the second game, if our game's running long, well, they might slide that second game anywhere from five to seven to ten, whatever it is. Well, now we're, we've got like a myriad of possible scenarios that could happen when we get off the air because you want to get off clean. So are we going to a break when the game ends? How much time do we have? 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Are we going to a break? And then the studio is going to take it on the backside. 
Are we going to a break and the announcers for the second game is going to get it? Are we just going directly from site to site? Well, sometimes we may not know that until 10 seconds before we need to know that. That's a live situation. Yeah. What's changing today with, you know, you have immersive content, social media, behind the scenes, everyone's got their phones, people are on the fields, kind of what we were talking about before we started recording here. I mean, there's YouTubers out there, right? And they have their phones, they have a, they might even have a camera person with them and all this kind of stuff. And soon there might be goggles and you'll be able to like, hey, I'm on the 50 yard line of the Dallas Cowboys game and I'm just sitting on my couch and I'm having a different experience with the broadcast. Like for that, what comes to mind for you or what do you see happening? Well, I also work for the NBA. So this is like my 44th year in the NBA. So I'm not working for this team, but I work for the league. So I work as a court administrator, timeout coordinator for national games. We just had our meeting yesterday for the year. And I'm actually the NBA rep on site for the Dallas uh, San Antonio game on October 24th. So you can see me sitting at midcourt yeah. on that game on TNT. Oh, so cool. So yeah. next Thursday night. But I also, when I'm not doing those games, sometimes I'm assigned the, the meta VR games. So I'll actually be making sure that the cameras are in the right place. And then I'll be sitting with the crew in the back wearing the meta goggles, you know, and I've literally experienced what this is like, you know, numerous times last year. And like, it's amazing because I thought it was going to be pretty much, you know, like avatars. You know, I thought like you're going to watch the game and the players are going to be kind of like animated, but they're not. You're literally put it on and you literally can be sitting right at center court on the front row and turn your head. And when the coach walks up, you can actually see him right next to you and then see the coach there. You know, you see the action like you're sitting at midcourt or you can be sitting like in the end zone, like when they're taking a free throw, there'll be a shot from behind the basket, you know, and you feel like you're, you could fall over. And then if you get bored with the game, you can just stand up, turn around and walk virtually into like a room in the back. And you can start shooting hoops with someone that might be in Russia or in Sweden, or it could be in New York or it could be right across the street. And you can actually talk to them too. So like now you're avatars, but at that point, and you can get souvenirs and, you know, whatever. You can buy food, like, on the virtual concession stand. So, you know, and now there's Cosmo, too, where these places around the country where you can actually go. You don't need to wear goggles. And they've just got the giant game right in front of you. And they have one in Dallas. They, I know they have one, you know, a, a dome in uh, like that in uh, Las Vegas. But there's a couple companies doing that now. and that's cool. So yeah, it's, it's really, really, really prevalent and really evolving right before virtually our eyes. Yeah. Well, so you, I could find someone who's been in the game for like, as long as you've been in it, that could look to this and say, oh man, this is just going to take away from the classicness of what we've had before, but you have a lot of energy for it and a lot of excitement to what, what this means. I mean, you've obviously gone through a lot of evolutions in sports in general, in the broadcasting it's just kind of taking that next step but it's really cool to see like the excitement and energy you have for it well one comment i had though to uh the meta was and the crew was i think until you actually get used to wearing those goggles they're a little bit bulky i think in a year or two they'll be you know more comfortable to wear over a long period you know you could play a game or do something for you know, an hour or 45 minutes, but to wear those, to me, I think you have to get used to it. And then I think the technology is going to keep improving. But what's happening now, it's, it's really cool, you know, so you can't get to the game. You might want to go to the game if you can't get to it and you have the goggles, you know, and you can pay for that version of the game. Yeah. I think that's right. I think you have different versions of the game because people are like, well, that's going to replace the in-game experience. So no one's going to go to the game anymore. I don't think that's the case. I think people are still going to crave that human to human interaction, being there, the sights, the smells, the sound. And I guess they could probably create the smell with that too. But I think you're just going to have different options for different people. Well, okay. So when people, when we just started out expanding television and the local sports, a lot of the executives were saying back in the day, 
no, we don't want to televise these really home games. It's going to take away from people wanting to go to the games. And then we kept telling them, well, there are a lot of people that want to go to the games, number one, that can't go to the game. But if they're on television, now you're making them want to go to the game. They're going, man, it looks kind of cool to go to the stadium. It looks kind of cool. I want to go buy some of that popcorn. I want to experience. I want to get a foul ball. I can't catch a foul ball at home. Right. I can't meet the players at home. I can't be there early and watch, you know, the players hit home runs and batting practice. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, why do you think the Atlanta Braves became so popular? It's because they were on TBS, you know, nationally, you know, on Turner. And now people were seeing them. And yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of wild. So in North Carolina, my daughter was getting ice hockey. This is a few years ago. And the closest teams, the Hurricanes, it's not that far. And so we go to a game. She loved it. And she wanted to watch more Hurricanes games. Can't watch them. They're blacked out here. I'm just like, this is the craziest thing ever. So you can buy a package. I get it. You can get to Bailey Sports and whatnot. But they're making it so you're not going to be a fan. So you're going to go watch a different team. And you're going to become a fan of that team because I can watch them out of network. No different than like, like you said, I know people from Utah who are diehard Braves fans because of what you just said. And the fact that a lot of teams somehow have not, and I know there's leagues involved and there's ownership involved and there's a lot of details that are beyond my pay grade that are making the decision to say, yeah, but now you just lost a fan as a result because they can't see the game and they don't have, they don't know what that, oh, I wish I was at that game because they don't get to see the game in the first place. And I think it's like a long-term play where like maybe you get that fan when they're eight, 12 years old, uh, you don't have them at all. Well, there's a lot of financial dynamics that come into play with why, you know, Bally Sports and some of these others were able to give the team millions of dollars. The teams were needing that money, not only because they get rights fees that cover most of it, but now, you know, from the network, main network, but the regional networks are going to actually provide a lot more millions of dollars to help pay for like A-Rod salary, you right. know, and other yeah. salaries that were at that time when the regional networks were starting out, you know, it was like, wow, cash bonanza bonus for us. But some fans can't even afford to pay for a subscription to cable, much less buy a package of games for $49 or $100 or whatever. So the teams are realizing that now as the regional networks are dying out. And like, for example, in Dallas, the WFA Channel 8 signed a contract with the Mavericks and they're going to show their games on their, um, on their over there station. Yeah. Well, it's a stream. Amazon came in there. I know and diamond sports with that whole Bailey sports situation came in there and, and I don't know when all that stuff takes over and every team's a little bit different, a lot in baseball and hockey, I believe in the NBA will be taking over some of those games, which kind of leads into the whole streaming. Have you worked with, obviously you're talking to meta, you know, Amazon Prime, Netflix is getting into it, Peacock, all of these, and it's obviously different. But what's your experience in working with them? What do you see happening in the world of streaming when it comes to live sports? Yeah, you can already see it. I produce games on Amazon, and we had a few games on Twitter, I think, you know, even then. But yeah, Amazon Prime is a big player, and there's more and more product going there. And as streaming is a little, you know, actually streaming is, easier for some people to get to because they don't need cable you know they can just through their computers a lot of the smart tvs they can just watch it directly there as well i mean a lot of people now don't even subscribe to cable they have youtube tv or other channels like that so and now the technology is is better to where if you're going to stream something you can get it in beautiful video whereas before it could be a little pixelated or not so clear. Now I don't see much difference at all. Looks better. So no. Yep. Yep. Well, you're bullish on all of it. It sounds like we talked about Walter Cronkite. I mentioned my son's at journalism school at Arizona State. And you talk a lot about like if someone's young in the industry, three, two, one around the air is obviously be a great book for them. And just, you know, listening to you. It's different, right? I don't know what it looks like cracking into that industry, whether it's in sports and broadcasting, journalism, media, just in general, there's so many different ways you can go. Like you talked a little bit about earlier today, like when you're speaking at these universities and what they could be doing, what other advice do you have for kids today? I mean, kids are going to college, there's, college is very expensive. 
all over the country. The, the cost of colleges continue to go up. The return maybe not so is, is not kept in line with it. I don't know what direction that goes, but when you're thinking about this industry and just media in general, like what thoughts do you have for these kids, what they should be thinking about, obviously getting internships and what else? Yeah, be working as hard as you can in, in different phases of the business. You want to learn how to write, right? That'll help you. You know, you say, well, I want to be an on-air t-. You know what? You learn how to write and that's going to help you later on, you know, in everything you do as far as producing, you know, an actual feature when you're writing copy for the talent. Who knows? Maybe one day you'll actually write a book. It took me a while, but there's so many more opportunities now than there were back in my day because of, like you said, where the social channels and you can do your own channel now. My son, for example, he went to University of Texas, got a marketing degree, but then he went to law school at SMU and he graduated. A guy passed the bar in his first attempt, went to work for a law firm and then went working for a company called NT Data as a staff attorney there. And as he was working there, he decided that he was going to start a YouTube channel on Pokemon because he was a big fan and expert in Pokemon. And turns out one day he comes to my wife and I and says, you know, mom, dad, I know you paid a lot to get me into uh, college and put me through law school. And it's a great experience. I got my law degree. But if I just dedicate myself exclusively to this YouTube channel, I think I can ultimately make more money than just, you know, working as an attorney. And we said, it's exactly what I told you earlier. I told him, you know, if that's your passion, that's what you want to do. We're behind you. Go for it. You can always go back and get another job in a law firm or do what you want. And he ended up starting the YouTube channel and he now has 1.9 million subscribers. Wow. His name is Leon Hart and uh, he became like a celebrity in the world of Pokemon. They're crazy. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it, there's so many different ways to go about it. Well, I appreciate it, Bob. I mean, you've given us a lot and there's so many more stories that you can't go into in an hour plus podcast, but they can get the book. They can listen to more interviews that you've had. Obviously, the books on Amazon, all those other places. Where should they go buy the book? Where they can let people learn more about you? Yeah, well, go to my website. It's my author website. It's robertsteinfeld.com. Real easy. Once you know how to spell my name, Robert yeah. <laughs> Steinfeld, and you look that up. But yeah, because on there, it'll tell you more about me. It'll tell you more about the book. And it'll have some links for you to to go to buy it. But, you know, Amazon.com has the hardcover and the the Kindle version, Barnes & Noble. And this morning, Amazon said, you know, it was the number two best-selling book, you know, for new sports journalism. And apparently so much so that it sold out this morning. (laughs) And the book hasn't even come out until October 22nd. I don't know when this is going to air. Probably already had come out by then. But you can buy it everywhere else. And eventually Amazon will get more hard copies. They'll get in, them in. But, yeah. <laughs> but everyone has it. You know, Powell's Books, Thrift Books, Google Books a Million. But TCU Press is the publisher. The university, TCU, Texas Christian University, TCU Press. Go to tcupress.org and, or you can find it there as well. But Robert Steinfeld dot com is the best place yeah and also when they buy the book make sure to leave a review those reviews do matter and they do help out a lot so and it's a great book yeah this is a great conversation bob i love these stories there's so many and like they can go on for days but i appreciate all that you bring to the table and your passion for what you do i think it's inspiring so thank you well thank you for having me on i appreciate it this is a quiet loud studios production the podcast network where reflection meets amplification.